You know, when I was in college, I loved to share my faith. And here's, here's how my gospel presentation kind of went. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Pretty good start. But then I'd say, you know, but, but you're separated from God because of your sin. So God sent his only son, Jesus, to pay the price for your sin. But because God is holy and just, he poured out his wrath and judgment upon Jesus. Now, if you will say this sinner's prayer and thank Jesus for what he's done and invite him into your heart and thank him for forgiving you of your sin, then you can go to heaven. Now, how many of you ever received a gospel presentation like that or maybe worse yet, you gave a gospel presentation like that? I know that was my case growing up and I, I just gave what was handed to me. And so I, I want to talk uh, this session about how do you view your relationship with God? I think you'll find out that everything in your life is dependent upon how you view your relationship with God. We live in the West here where we're a, a guilt, innocence culture, and so we, we tend to look at all of our relationships and really everything through a legal lens. And so I think we have this legal contract idea with God a lot of times here in the West. That's what I grew up with. But do you see God through a legal contract lens or do you see him more through a loving marriage covenant? You know, I think a lot of us don't realize that the dominant uh, imagery or way of picturing relationship between God and Israel in the Old Testament is through the metaphor of marriage. And so in the Old Testament, Yahweh, or God, who was trying to, to woo Israel back from all of her idolatrous relationships with other gods. And uh, so the imagery is this. It's Yahweh as a husband and uh, Israel as the bride or as the wife. You see it all the way through Isaiah. You see it in Jeremiah. You see it in Ezekiel. You see it in Hosea uh, and other scriptures in the Old Testament. I think about uh, the prophetic calling on uh, the prophet Hosea. How would you like to have been a Hosea? So God comes to Hosea and says, Hosea, here's what I want you to do. I want you to marry a prostitute named Gomer. I don't, I don't know whether which is worse, that he had to marry a prostitute or that her name was Gomer. And for those of you who are named Gomer ladies, I, you know, please forgive me. Uh, they have children together, and after their marriage, she doesn't quit her day job. She continues to be promiscuous and have adulterous relationships. Yet God tells Hosea, pursue your wayward harlot wife. In fact, in Hosea 3.1, it says this, she is loved by another man and she is an adulteress. So he says, Hosea, go back, go back to, to Gomer and buy her back from the slave market. See, she was on the auction block, auction block to uh, be sold for human sex slavery. And so Hosea goes there and he buys his own wife back. Well, this is a great picture of a prophetic picture of Yahweh's great love for his wayward people, Israel. He's comparing himself to a husband whose wife has committed adultery. And so Yahweh is seen, God is seen in the Old Testament as patient and sacrificing and just really beyond our comprehension. So ultimately, the New Testament comes around and with the death of Jesus, the Son of God, Yahweh redeems his lost bride from her self-destruction to live a life of love and freedom and fullness in Christ. In the New Testament, we see this picture, this theme, this metaphor continued on. It, Jesus is pictured as a heavenly bridegroom. He came in search of a bride. You see it in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. You see it in the Gospel of John. In the book of Revelation, the church is depicted as the bride of Christ. And so you see this huge wedding feast in Revelation uh, 19 and 21 and 22. Throughout the New Testament, the church is portrayed as Every person who's entered into a new covenant relationship or bridal relationship with Jesus. Listen to this. In Ephesians 5.32, it says, Paul writing, Marriage is the beautiful design 
of the Almighty, a great sacred mystery, marriage. It was meant to be a vivid example of Christ and his church. You know, a lot of times I think we miss the, the deeper picture, the deeper meaning of this passage in Ephesians. We get so enamored with how husbands are supposed to treat their wives and how wives are supposed to submit to their husbands that we miss the bigger picture that Paul is trying to, to show us Look, our relationship with God, marriage is just an object lesson of what it looks like to have intimacy with God in this marriage relationship. So how do you view salvation? How do you view your relationship with God? Uh, is it more of a legal contract or is it more of a marriage covenant? Uh, I think it's important because the way you view your salvation will determine the way you live it out. So I want us to look at at just some comparisons and contrasts between what it looks like to, to have this Western mind, this legal contract versus a covenant relationship of a marriage covenant. See, a legal contract with God looks kind of like this. It's a legal transaction. It, it focuses on my rights, getting what I want out of it. It's just part of our cultural thinking. So whenever we think about relationship with God, it's like, how can I transact business with God? As, as far as a loving marriage covenant, it's really focused on oneness in a covenant relationship. It's God's way of thinking. All throughout the scripture, God has covenants with different people. And one of the greatest ways to understand scripture is through a covenantal lens. Now, how do we see God? How does a legal contract see God? He's, a legal contract sees God as a judge usually a, a hacked-off judge, an angry judge, kind of a red-faced judge that's holy, can't stand sin. Sin must be judged all about justice and sin eradication. Now, that, that was kind of the view I got, that God was really mad at sin, but he was really mad at us because we did sin, and sin had to be paid for. It had to be taken care of. It had to be eradicated. How did Jesus picture uh, God. He didn't picture him as a judge. It's interesting. The metaphor he used more often than any in the New Testament is God as a father. We, we talked earlier in an earlier session about the prodigal son or the loving father and how God loves all people, outcast, rebellious, those who have religious pride. He says, look, I forgive you and I want relationship with with you. That's, that's God. That's the heart of God. So the primary problem with the legal contract view of salvation is it's not uh, consistent with the revelation of God that Jesus gave. Let's look at a few others. How does the legal contract see mankind, humanity? Well, it sees us as a guilty defendant, as sinners. You know, I, I grew up early on. I learned some verses like, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3.23. That there's none righteous, not even one. Romans 3.10. The wages of sin is death. You know, uh, the first part of Romans 6.23. But how does, does a loving covenant marriage relationship see mankind? How does God see mankind through the eyes of Jesus? Well, as a lost bride, not as a guilty defendant, but a lost bride. We've lost the plot of the story. We don't know our identity, that we were called and created to be image bearers of God. And so we've lost our way. We've lost our whole purpose for existing. That's a ver very different way of seeing humanity. We'll see each other differently. If we see the world is totally depraved and sinful, we treat people in a certain way. If we see people as lost and just have lost their way and their wayward, then that's a very different thing. What about Jesus? How does a legal lens see Jesus? Well, it sees Jesus as this defense lawyer. Since we're a guilty defendant, sinner, that's mankind, Jesus is the defense lawyer. He steps in, he takes our punishment for us so that justice can be achieved. That's a legal view. Well, on a loving marriage covenant view, Jesus is seen as the bridegroom, the bridegroom who is in search of a bride. He enters into our darkness. He enters into our distorted way of thinking. 
and he becomes our way. He becomes our light. He becomes our truth. He becomes our life. In fact, John 10, 10 says that he came that we might have life and life to the fullest, the way we were expected, the way we were designed, the way God intentionally planned for us to live. And so this bridal theme, it's all through the scripture. What about the end game? What, what is the end game of this relationship with God? Well, I'm glad you asked because it's, it's really the important thing. Through a legal lens, the end game is, well, I want to certify that I am free from all charges. In other words, acquittal, that I get acquitted. See, acquitted means to be, to be declared not guilty. Now, an acquittal is basically a get out of hell free card. And that's what I would have grown up with. This mindset was that my goal is to get to heaven one day. Eternal life is about going to heaven one day. And it becomes kind of this gospel that's one dimensional. It's either it's, it's heaven, yes, hell, no, right? We want to get to heaven, but we don't want to go to hell. And the motivation behind that can become fear that you know, you, we can just kind of dang pe dangle people over hell and tell them how bad they are and that if they don't get straightened up and receive what Jesus did for them, they're going to go to hell. Can I tell you, that's not how Jesus handled things. His end game was completely different. In fact, Jesus said the end game is oneness. It's bridal love. If you go to John 17, you'll, you'll see that's the theme. He wants us to be in oneness with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, with one another. He says, you are declared innocent of all charges, not not guilty. There's a big difference between being innocent and declared not guilty. Innocence is a restoration to our purity. It's a res restoration back to the garden, our original identity, how God created us. Jesus says something really interesting. He says, eternity is now. Listen to this in John 17, three, he says, this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. He says, it's a relationship with the Father and with the one that's one with him, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, and it begins right now. The motivation, Jesus says, is love that the end game is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God demonstrates his love for us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is love, 1 John says. See, the gospel is not um, just one of these, is it heaven, yes, hell, no. The gospel is a way of life. It's the goodness of God. That, that's what it's really all about. So what does that look like to see this salvation lived out. Well, through a legal contract paradigm, it means this, it's, it's a one-time uh, transaction. You say a sinner's prayer, you make a confession of faith, you sign a contract, you, your acquittal is accomplished, and you don't have to go to hell. And so Jesus is the Savior who steps in and takes your punishment, but in reality, Lordship to Jesus becomes kind of optional. And you've got your fire insurance, you've got your acquittal. So the big question becomes, how do I maintain my acquittal? Can I lose my acquittal? Can I lose my salvation? What, how far can, is too far? How far can I go? And so you begin to do things that are contrary to the heart and the will of God. They're not consistent with the heart of Jesus. Now, what is the end game or the salvation lived out of a covenant paradigm, of a new covenant, uh, loving marriage covenant? Well, it's an ongoing relationship, as you would expect. When you say yes to Jesus, you are entering into that you're I do to a relationship that is ongoing and growing and becoming. It's like Lisa and I have been married for 36 years, and it's a nurturing cultivating, growing, becoming relationship in the same way God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit invite us into oneness with Him and it becomes an ongoing relationship. If you're the same person you were a year ago today, you might want to question that because relationships grow, they become. That's why repentance is such a good word. It's about 
changing our way of thinking to align with God's. So the whole point of salvation is it's about a marriage. You probably never heard that before, but that is the motif, that is the theme, that's the imagery. The good news is that God wants a marriage covenant relationship with us. His whole life poured out for us, our whole life poured out for Him. The good news is that Jesus came as a bridegroom to, to rescue His bride from the self-imprisonment, the distorted, diluted thinking uh, of sin, Satan, idolatry, wrong time. I mean, you just go down the list there. But the cross is God's marriage proposal. This is what you mean to me. This is how valuable you are to me. Will you marry me? That's what Jesus is saying. You know, in Romans 10, 9, it says, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved, will be salvaged, will be rescued, will be saved, healed, delivered, made whole, restored. So the importance of that confession, Jesus is Lord, is that it is your I do to the groom, Jesus. How about you? How do you view your salvation? Do you see it as a legal contract? Do you see it as a loving marriage contract, a covenant? It will, it will determine the way you live.